Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and I'm going to try to not make this a video about parasocial relationships, but it just might take over. So parasocial relationships are the idea that you listen to a DJ, or you watch, uh, or you listen to a podcast, or you watch a YouTube channel, and it becomes such a part of your life that you feel like, not that you, just that you've heard of this person, but that you have some sort of relationship. I'm not saying you're hallucinating, you like hang out together, but it's more than just, you know, you and the weatherman or whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, like, uh, I remember a few, a few years ago when Black Lives Matter was becoming a thing, both as a concept and completely separate as an organization named Black Lives Matter, which was done so very cynically. So if you ever said you didn't like anything that that organization did, you're like, oh, so you don't like Black Lives Matter? You don't believe... No, I, I don't like that organization, but I believe that black people and their actual lives matter. There's a difference, and it was very cynical what that organization did. So at one point, uh, Long Beach Griffey, who is not woke, he's very much anti-SJW, but... I'm guessing he probably saw a couple hundred people say, Black Lives Matter ain't shit. I hate hearing Black Lives Matter. And some of those people were talking about the organization. Some of them were uh, talking about the concept. And he got bummed out. You don't really see this guy get bummed out very much. So, uh, you know, you could tell he was kind of, um, I don't know, just getting worn down by this stuff. And so he was, uh, so I literally did a video. I was like, I don't know you. And I'm pretty sure you don't watch this channel, but your life matters to me if that helps. Although, let's not be weird about it. So anyway, um, one of the things, uh, having a channel, watching other people with channels, having, you know, friendships, and quite frankly, parasocial relationships with, you know, I never met these people, but we talk. You see people, they ebb and flow. Sometimes they're just rolling with the punches and sometimes stuff really, really gets to them. And one of the things I absolutely hate is when someone's like, oh, I love this channel, I love this channel. Oh, they said that one thing, now I hate them. It's like I talk about this, the, the life cycle of a stalker. I like you, I love you, I just found out you were evil the entire time, uh, I must now punish and destroy you. Or you could just say, Sounds like he's going through some shit, and I'm just gonna, you know, maybe just not listen as much, or just take it with a grain of salt. So what I'm trying to say is that Perch, his videos lately seem to be a little off. The funny thing is that a couple months ago, I thought they were better than ever. They were very concise, you know, but he's, he's angry. Now he admits to being angry, which is good. One of the most ridiculous things is when someone's angry and they won't admit it. It's like, you angry? No, bro, I'm fine. It's like you're freaking, do, do you know, this isn't like, you know, a, a, a IRC chat where all I have to go off is, you know, your words. Like, your body language, everything about you literally says you're very angry. So he he's talking and he's angry and he's talking about being angry. Okay, so that's a fair enough point. So I'm not going to be as like, Percho, no, no, no. Just, just give him some time. Give him some freaking time. Jeez, like you listen to people for years and then you want to freaking destroy them because they said like one thing you don't like. Uh, so he said like two or three. <laughs> so anyway, he did a video. And I'm at the point right now where I used to like, oh, I've already done a video on that. And I'll just like repost it. And it's like, because I can kind of remember like the thumbnail or like what month I... I almost feel like I've done this exact video, but maybe not. Just stick around till the end. Um, so anyway, he was talking about, you know, the idea that um, if content was better, uh, comics would sell more. And I did a video a few days ago where I was like, yeah. And he's like, not necessarily. And then he brought up several, for instances, <laughs> Woo, I just really didn't like them. So he, he said... There's no theoretical customer that's going into the comic book store every week, seeing everything is woke, and then leaving disgusted without buying books. And I'm just, I'm just like, okay. I've been listening to your channel for a few years. I think shortly after you started. I know you're smarter than this, but you also are talking about being very angry about it. It sounds like a bunch of things. So, okay. 
Yes, of course. That theoretical customer that goes in every single week, never likes anything because everything is woke, that doesn't exist. But I want to talk about comics like we know comics. Comics is, when have you ever gone to someone's house? I will say the one exception is Sandman. I do know people who only read Sandman. They're not traditional comic book uh, readers. They got into it by hook or by crook. You know, college roommate recommended it, saw it at the library, whatever. So Sandman is an exception. Sandman, I have met many Sandman fans that only read Sandman. That's fine. 99 point, a lot of nines, percentage point, people have a collection. And that is the appeal of comics and manga, that you have a collection. You're going to have a book and you're going to be like, oh, here's my Captain America, here's my Daredevil, here's my Flash. Oh boy, I'm sticking, well, I didn't mess up the alphabet, that's cool. Um, so, uh, Marines are good at the alphabet. <laughs> you got to be good at one or the other. Um, but anyway, so the thing is that, you know, he, he has ideas and he talks about, you know, point of sale and, you know, newsstand and all this type of stuff. But the way that advertising works is you don't say we are going to do an amazing Super Bowl ad. We are going to sell the hell out of Coca-Cola. We're going to have all the stars, amazing music and special effects. No, they advertise it freaking everywhere. Coca-Cola gets advertised everywhere on literally like the one in 1,000 chance. Jeez, one in probably 10,000 chance. They're like, I don't know what to drink. Ah, yeah, Coca-Cola. That's fine. Word of mouth is the greatest advertising campaign for comics. It is essentially the main one. There have been a few times, G.I. Joe, in the early 1980s, they would have literal ads where it would be a cartoon that went into the cover of the book, um, and that takes a lot more coordination than traditional comic book uh, printing. You know, then you got to know what the cover is a lot farther ahead of time. But um, that was mainstream advertising. And I did see that, and it was very compelling. But it was one of many things. One of the things I do in my Jawbreakers universe is nobody knows how they got their powers. Because it's kind of like, hey, what day did you get cancer? You know, it's your gene plus, you know, your diet plus, you know, whatever, you know, ores you were near and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's how advertising works. It's like, why did I buy G.I. Joe, Joe 13? Was it because of the cartoon, which I saw many times and was cool? Well, I saw the previous cartoons and I didn't buy them. Uh, was it because of the toy line, which I was starting to collect? Well, I liked it okay. I didn't really get into G.I. Joe until the second year. The first year, it was like the same body on almost every G.I. Joe. Um, so I was like, yeah, that's kind of a cheap toy line. Because, uh, you know, Star Wars, obviously, they were all different. So it was a combination of things. You know, it was buying the toy line, thinking it was okay. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the cartoon commercials. It was the, you know, ubiquity of having it everywhere. And just, it, it was constantly going into your mind. G.I. Joe, it's a thing. It's a cartoon. It's toys. It's comics. You've checked out two of them. Why don't you check out that third one? So, but traditionally throughout the history of comics, you don't have that. You have all, you know, the Time Magazine bang, a zap, pow, comics aren't just for kids anymore, yeah, with like for 10, 20 years, that was the title of every single article about comics, maybe 30 years, um, and you know, in the 1990s, they would talk about, oh, this is, you know, selling for a lot and collectible, and you can pay off your kid's college by buying brigade number one, whatever, fine, but traditionally, the way that people get into comics is it's just kind of around and they hear good things and they, you know, they go to a birthday party, they're visiting a cousin or they're at, you know, a library and you just see a bunch of them. That's the way. It's not having King of Spies be really good. So one of his examples is like if content sells books, then why didn't King King of Spies spell, you know, sell 200,000 copies? It's because nothing sells 200,000 copies. And we know this. People go into comic book shops for Marvel and DC. 
If Marvel diminishes, the entire industry diminishes, and that's what we're finding. When X-Men sells 40,000 copies, you're not going to have an indie book sell 200,000. Not even Walking Dead. By the way, I need information. There's this, it's called like Grimes 2000, Rick Grimes 2000. I saw a TikTok talk about it, and then I Googled it, and like every article said something completely different. They're like, it comes out this June, and then they're like, it came out like on a webisode last year, but I can't find any place to read it online. It looks pretty cool. See how you sit, like, and the thing is, I'm going to say that. Someone else is going to say, I saw it two or three ways. It's like, oh, someone had the web zone of the pizza rolls, whatever. They sent the proof of purchase from the pizza rolls to the web zone, and they got to see it. It was faxed to them. Whatever. However you see it. It's just a bunch of ways, and it's out there. And it's And yes, content will not magically draw people into stores, and of course, nobody is going into a store every week and seeing 100% woke content, and yet they still keep going. But what happens is you get enough comics. When I got into comics, like Amazing Spider-Man, Todd McFarlane, that was it. That was my favorite. And I still had 20 more other comics I freaking loved. And there was a couple dozen that were legitimately excellent. And, you know, when people talk about manga, they're like, I read One Piece only. No, you read One Piece and Death Note and Baku the Grappler or whatever these things are called. And you're going to have your collection. It's going to, you know, you're going to have these six volumes of this manga, a couple of volumes of another manga, maybe you just started on a new one. Content is key, but it can't, you can't rely on, you know, one or two good books drawing people and making them have a weekly habit. You need an overall industry that is good, that, you know, retains based on sales, that hires based on merit. We now hires off of sexuality and skin color and retains for the same thing. It is it is a it, it is an un industry, and you know it gets frustrating. We have people who are traditionally pretty good at analysis of the industry, and uh, you know you get stressed out, you get tired of you know hearing the same things. But no, um, none of the hypotheticals he brought work. But the thing is, if there were enough good books. Not a couple, not Space Bandits in 2018 and King of Spies in 2021. Jeez, it's like the only things I can really recommend from the direct market over the last five years. It's two different Mark Millar miniseries that came out two years apart, two or three years apart. You gotta have, you know, a quorum. You gotta have not just a couple books, but enough books. There was never a time when I went to the comic book store and I used to ride my bicycle three miles, it was only uphill one way, in the Nebraska heat. That was really hot. Three, four miles from Papillion up to uh, <coughs> La Vista to go to Dragon's Lair. That was, and I wasn't even in the north side of Papillion, I was like south of Halleck Park. <laughs> like three people get these references. It was, it was, a, it was a ways. There was never a time, ever, where there were less than three really good comics. I'm talking about comics that 30 years later, you'd be like, damn, this is freaking good. I could still share those Daredevil, Captain America, X-Factor, New Mutants, X-Force, Uncanny, uh, did I ever say that one? Uh, Amazing Spider-Man, Web of Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man. Adjective. Uh, actually, that one wasn't very good. Uh, the Andesenti and the Eric Larson; those were good. I had a, a whole passel. <laughs> I do not have to. I do not have time to look up whether passel has a racist etymology. The word I was going to say in the previous uh, video was bugaboo, which I was like, that's got to have racist origins. Turns out it's like Welsh or Gaelic. That's that's where it, and then it's a also it's also a uh, uh, black culture term. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, they say that in a Destiny's Child uh, video. So um, you need a quorum, you know. You need a, a, a quorum, a, a minimum amount of good comics, and then it becomes a weekly, monthly habit, and then it becomes a collection, 
and then word of mouth sells it. You know how hard it is to tell people to get into comics? Well, every two years, Mark Millar comes out with a really fire miniseries. Okay, cool. What do I do in between? Nothing. You don't do anything. <laughs> you order crowdfunding books that look cool, and you go to the library, and you you read back issues. You you buy you know X Men annual whatever for the third time because there's nothing good out there. No, we need good comics. We need a lot of good comics, and we need them all the time. And how do you get that? You hire based on potential. You retain based on sales. Sexuality, skin color, gender expression, political activism, none of those things should be ways to hire people. Anyway, thanks for watching.